Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Well, today we want to talk, talk about this topic, the blessings of living generously. Let's pray. Lord God, in this place just now, we come with a great desire to know you more, to experience your, your presence powerfully in this time of worship. And so speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. So we open your word. We, we thank you in advance for the blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said a lot about giving. For example, here in Acts 20.35, Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And you believe that today? More joy in giving than in receiving. Uh, I looked up some key words in the Bible, and it's very interesting. You can tell how important certain ideas are by how many times they're mentioned in Scripture. So I looked up uh, in the New International Version, uh, the word believe, and of course, believer believing, 249 times. That's a lot of times, isn't it? This is an important concept in the Bible, believing. Uh, but if you look up prayer, uh, 358 times prayer is mentioned in the Bible. So you, you can see you know, what are the important themes by how many times they're mentioned in Scripture. Uh, and then the word love, lover, loves, loving, 700 times. But guess what? When you look up the word giving, take a look at this. Over 2,000 times in the Bible, the Bible talks about giving. So where, where does the Bible put most emphasis? <laughs> you can see it's on giving, isn't it? And, and it's so beautiful. Jesus mentioned this constantly. But the point is that giving is the essence of the Christian life. It's not, it's not something you tack on. No, it's the very essence of living as a Christian, living generously. And Jesus, of course, is the ultimate giver of all. But uh, today, uh, here's another thing Jesus said about giving. He said, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So who determines what you receive? Who determines it? And the Bible says, I determine what I'm going to receive, because the measure that I use, how much I give, determines how much I'm going to receive. And my, my question to you today is this, what exactly do we receive? Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Well, what, what, what do we receive? What, what blessings do we receive when we give? So I thought it would be good just to spend a few minutes and look at, at the blessings that God has promised when we are generous. Uh, it turns out there are at least seven blessings the Bible mentions, and it's kind of inspiring, kind of exciting. The first one is this. Let's take a look. Giving makes us more like God. Uh, John 3.16, of course, the best known verse in the whole Bible, says God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave his only begotten son. Everything we have is a gift from God, right? Every single thing we have is a gift from God. But when God gave us his son, Jesus, I mean, that is the greatest gift that we could ever receive. And so at this season of the year, when we remember the gift of Christ there, born in Bethlehem, we were reminded that, that the gift of Jesus was not only uh, a baby in a manger, it was also a man on the cross dying for us. And that, that is the great message of Christmas, that God loved us so much that he gave. And so the, the point of it is today, um, we can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving, right? I mean, I can, I can give someone something even if I don't love them. <laughs> but if I do love someone, I will give because that is, that's, that's just the way it works, you know? To be like God is to be a giver. And so giving makes us more like God. I remember when I was dating Nancy here on this campus back in the early 1980s, before you were born, long before you were born. Uh, I couldn't keep my money in my pocket. 
uh, I, I was always buying something for Nancy. And of course, I didn't have a car, you know, so the, the closest store was the ABC. So I'd go and I'd buy her a card or I'd buy her a poster. Uh, you know, I would buy her a book or I'd buy her some music. I was always buying something. I couldn't keep my money in my pocket because you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving, you know. And so giving makes us more like God. It shapes our character. Well, the second thing, the second blessing that comes from giving is this. Giving draws us closer to God. And, and the premise here in Matthew 6.21 is that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So I'm going to ask you today, where is your heart. I can tell you exactly where your heart is. Your heart is wherever your treasure is. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Jesus said. This is the treasure principle. Where, whatever you treasure, whatever you value most, that's where your heart will be. For some people, it's their home. You know, Their home is their treasure. For some people, it's their job, their career. For some people, it's their family. For some people, it's the clothes. You know, they just love their clothes. And, but what, whatever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So follow me here. Every time I give to God, it moves me closer to God because that's where my treasure is, you see? And so giving draws us closer to God. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that uh, sometimes we, we're reluctant to give, and yet the Bible says there's so many blessings that come. First of all, it, it uh, makes us more like God. Secondly, it draws us closer to God. And thirdly, giving is an antidote to materialism. Now, materialism is, is a problem, isn't it, today? We, we have so much emphasis on stuff and buying stuff. And, and uh, the human nature is that we want more. We always want more. But it soon gets to the place where it's not that we own our possessions. It's that they own us. You know? And this problem with materialism, it's like we're chained to it. Um, and there's a lie out there. The lie is this. Happiness can be purchased. A little retail therapy, you know, when you're feeling down a bit, you know, just head out to the mall. You feel the happier, you know, when you buy stuff. That's the lie. Now, we know that's not true. If it were true, the people that had the most stuff would be the most happy. And that's not true, is it? As we look around the world, we often find that it's the people that have the least that are the most happiest. So happiness cannot be purchased, though this is the lie. And, and uh, you know, the world says, get, get, get. And God is saying, give, give, give. You know, it's just the opposite. But um, I, I, I see constantly advertising on the internet. If you just use this toothpaste, you'll really be sexy. <laughs> Who are you kidding? Who are you kidding? You know, or if you use this deodorant, you'll really be successful. Who are you kidding? You know, these marketing ploys. If you, if you just buy this product, you will be so happy. Who are you kidding? You, can't, you cannot buy happiness. And yet these are the messages that are, that are bombarding us, particularly at this time of year. You know, everybody's trying to get your dollars because they know you're thinking about what can I buy as a Christmas present for this person or that person. And so... You know, we're just being bombarded. Billions of dollars are being spent every day to get you to buy stuff. And money cannot buy happiness. Uh, giving is an antidote to materialism. Look at this. This is, this is what Paul tells Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor, and, and Paul tells him, he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Now, the, the word command, that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Paul says, Timothy, you tell them, command them, don't put your hope in wealth. It is so uncertain. Instead, put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And no, I want you to notice this. God wants us to enjoy life, doesn't he? 
Now, God gives us so much. And he, he's like a loving parent. He wants us to enjoy life. And so he, he gives us everything for our enjoyment. But we, we don't put our hope in money, which is so uncertain. It's here today, gone tomorrow. We put our hope in God, who provides all we need. And he gives us what he gives us so that we can enjoy life. But he doesn't give us what he gives us so we can spend it all on ourselves. No. He blesses us so that we can bless others. And so Paul continues here to Timothy. He says, command them. He's talking about the people that have money. By the way, if you live in Canada, you are in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world. I don't even care what, what income you make. If you live in Canada, you are among the most wealthy people in the world. And so this is for all of us, you know. And Paul says to Timothy, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. See, this is the point. This is the antidote against materialism, that when we share with others, when we're generous with others, notice what happens. Paul says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, don't miss this point. Paul says the life that is truly living is a life of generosity. If you want to live life to the fullest, give. Because when you give, there's great joy, great satisfaction, great happiness, and it's an antidote against materialism. And so you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. Now this, this might sound um, a little interesting. You know, there's different love languages they, they talk about, and, and there's five primary love languages, but one of them is gift giving. How many of you think you have the love language of gift giving? All right. Some of us do. You know, there's quality time, there's physical touch and closeness, there's um, deep acts of service, you know, these different love languages, but, but gift giving, I never thought that that was actually my primary love language, but I think it is, because I love giving stuff to people. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I have these uh, little hobbies. I like to make pens in my shop, wooden pens, and so I almost always have a pen on me, but uh, it's kind of fun to make. It doesn't take that long to make, but it makes a beautiful gift. And so I love to just give a pen away because I feel joy when I give a pen away. And, uh, and the, the reality is the Bible is saying that when we are generous, when we give, that that is the life that is really living, you see. And so... You make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. John Wesley, years ago, he, uh, he's the one that was the founder of the Methodist church. He preached this sermon one time. He said, get all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. <laughs> and uh, he, he made a great point. Uh, you know, we need to be industrious. We, we need to be hardworking. We need to get all we can. And we need to save all we can. We need to be a little frugal, you know, not just kind of waste money, but save it so that we can give all we can. That's how we enjoy life. Now, the fourth blessing that comes from giving, what is the first one? Makes us more like God. Second one, it draws us closer to God. Third one, it's an antidote against materialism. Fourthly, giving strengthens our faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I need my faith strengthened regularly. <laughs> and, and I want you to notice this, how, how this works. Uh, Malachi 3.10. God says, bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so there will be ample provisions in my temple. Now, even back in, in uh, the time of Malachi, people were just bringing a little tithe, not really their full tithe. And so God says, bring, bring the full tithe, the full 10%. Bring it to the, you know, the temple treasury. There'll be ample provisions in my temple. He says, test me in this. 
and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. God says, look, you, you bring your tithe, the full tithe, and I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna open the windows of heaven, pour out an incredible blessing. And so whenever I get paid, which is once a month, I, uh, I get out my phone because I, I give uh, on the Adventist giving app on my phone and I start entering it in, you know, my tithe and then, you know, church family budget and then conference advance and, you know, and, and I get to the point where it adds it all up for me and I go, whoa, how do you do this too? Whoa, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know whether I'm the only one that does that, but I think, I, I, I look at the total, and I go, wow, that's almost my mortgage payment. And, uh, and then I do this. I say, God, I am putting you first because you have promised to take care of me. And it's an act of faith. It's an act of faith. When I, you know, when I, hit that button on my phone and boom, the money is transferred. I have just put my faith in God that he is going to take care of all my needs. And when I do that, every time I do that, it strengthens my faith. Especially when I see what God does and how he provides and how he takes care of me. I, uh, I learned this early in life. Um, I was going to school as a student here. I was a, I was a new Adventist. I was baptized at age 18. And within one year, I was here to study to be a pastor. And I was just kind of learning and navigating this tithing thing and, and, and giving offerings because you know, the Bible says it's not just a matter of returning tithe. When you return your tithe, you're not really giving God anything. You're just returning to him what's his. When you give an offering, now, now you're giving something. You know, But um, back in those days, I would tithe on my net. And when I got my income tax back, I would tithe it. I don't do that anymore. I tithe on my gross now. When I get my income tax returned back, I just spend it all. It actually goes on my mortgage. But, uh, but anyhow, I, I, I tithe on my gross now because I believe that, that the roads, you know, the taxes I pay provide the roads that I drive on and the medical care that benefits me and all these things. So even though these are indirect blessings, they're still an increase to me. So I just tithe on my gross pay. But uh, back then I wasn't. I was tithing on my net. So, so I, I, I had a good summer job. I, I worked as a, I was a pilot. The boards would come off the green chain. Every time a board came off, I would pilot. <laughs> but uh, I worked in, in British Columbia in a place called Williams Lake at the sawmill, piling lumber. And uh, anyhow, I, I was getting a pretty decent income tax return. It was $2,000. And the uh, problem is, before... I got the money, it was spent. I mean, I knew how much I was getting, but I had spent it all. And uh, I needed to return $200 as tithe. Now, I was going as a student missionary to Africa for a year, and, uh, and I literally had nothing. I had zero money. And, uh, and I went to Eric Raja because I owed the school $200. Just coincidentally, I owed the school $200 to pay my school bill, and I owed $200 tithe. And so I sat down in Eric's office and I said, look, Eric, I will pay my school bill, but I need to return my tithe first. And he respected that. He said, that's fine. We'll, we'll keep your account open here. And so I returned that $200 tithe. I, I owed $200 to the school. I, I, on my way to Africa, I was going home for a week to Ontario. And do you know... Different friends came to me, many of my friends at church, and they said, we understand you're going to Africa. You know, here's a little something. <laughs> Another person, you know, here's a card, there's a little something in the card, and it added up to over $600. 600 bucks different people gave me, you know, just 
You're going to Africa, why don't you have a little something? So I paid my school bill and I went to Africa with 400 bucks. But I tell you what, I know that if I had not returned the tithe, I wouldn't have seen that $600. Wouldn't have been able to pay my school bill to later. I, you know, you can, you can say, well, you don't know that, Pastor Jeff. I do. I know in my heart. Because God says when we, uh, you know, return our tithe, that he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing beyond our wildest dreams. It's the way it works. And so I, I want to challenge you today. If, you know, if you're not returning a full tithe, I want to challenge you. Do it for the next three months. And if God doesn't bless you, you let me know, we'll give you your money back. Is that fair enough? It's a, it's a, tithe, it's a tithe challenge, three month tithe challenge. You, you practice returning your full tithe and if God does not bless you, we'll give you your money back. And uh, I, I actually made this challenge a couple years ago. There was a, there was a lady here that said, I'm gonna take that challenge. And she stepped up and she started returning her tithe within two weeks she came into $100,000. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the whole story, and, and I didn't ask her permission, so I won't give any names, but I'm just telling you that it works. God says, you put me first, and I will bless beyond our wildest dreams. So, so giving strengthens our faith. When we see how God blesses, wow, we just really see that uh, it pays to go out in faith every month and return our tithe and give an offering, a love offering. Um, notice this. It's interesting that, that Malachi 3.10, we just read that. Now we're going to go to Proverbs 3.10. Starting in verse 5, it says, Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. The Bible says this. When we give God our first and our best, he blesses beyond our wildest dreams. I don't know if you have barns, but if you do have barns, they will burst, all right? And, and God is just saying, you know, I, I'm going to bless you. But, but many times it goes like this. We, we say, well, God, look, you, you bless me first. You give me the 100,000 first, and then I'll give. No, God says it doesn't work that way. He says, you return your tithe, you give the offering, and then I will bless you, you know. And so this, this strengthens our faith. The fifth thing we learn, uh, the, first, the fifth blessing here, is that giving is an investment for eternity. It's an investment in God's kingdom, and it's a secure investment. I can tell you what, there are very few secure investments in this world. You just look at my retirement portfolio this year has been going the wrong way, <laughs> you know. But, but when we invest in God's kingdom, it is secure. And the, I will tell you what, the interest is amazing. Uh, Matthew 6.20, Jesus says, Don't store up treasures on earth. Moths and rust can destroy them and thieves can break in and steal them. Instead, store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy them and thieves cannot break in and steal them. Jesus says, giving is an investment for eternity. When we store up our treasures in heaven, they're secure. Uh, let me ask you, have you ever seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer? I've never seen that. Because the truth is you can't take it with you. You can't. You, you, you cannot take it with you. But you can send it on ahead. <laughs> And when you lay up treasures in heaven, you know, we, we, we are sending it on ahead when we, when we give to God and our treasures in heaven. Now, I, I, I want to tell you this, uh, and we read this earlier, but I want to just draw your attention to it. First Timothy 6, Paul says to Timothy, tell them to use their money to do good. They, they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future. So when we give to God, when we give to others, we're storing up our treasure in heaven, and that is a secure investment for eternity. I want you to imagine this for a moment. I want you to imagine uh, 
that when Jesus comes and uh, we arrive there in the new earth, uh, why don't you imagine you're, you, you know, you're eager to see your mansion because Jesus says, you know, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And so you're eager to see your mansion. And Peter takes you to this little tiny house. You say, Peter, what, what gives here? You? What about the mansion? And Peter says to you, you know, it was the best we could do with what you sent ahead. <laughs> So, so let's lay up our treasures in heaven. You don't want to be disappointed in the mansion when you get there. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. That's a little bit of a, little bit of a tongue in cheek. But, but when we give to God, when we give to others, we are laying up our treasure in heaven. Number six, giving blesses us in return. We we feel refreshed. We, we you know, Proverbs eleven twenty five just says this: A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're on the computer, you know, you hit the refresh button and it just kind of a fresh start and just fixes stuff. And, and God says, if you refresh others, if you're generous to others, you're giving to others, you are going to be refreshed. I like that. It's, it's a wonderful promise. But giving blesses us in return. And the, you know, the, the interesting thing is this, and I hope you've learned this secret in life, whatever you give out is what you get back. The Bible says we reap what we sow, right? And so if you give out criticism, what are you going to get back? Yeah. If, if, if you give out gossip, what are you going to get back? <laughs> but if you give out encouragement, you know, whatever you give out, it comes back to you. You refresh others, you will be refreshed. And so giving always always blesses us in return. And that's a wonderful thing. So let me ask you this. How do you want to be remembered when you're gone? I, uh, I hope that uh, if, if I should pass before Jesus comes, I hope that my children, that one of the things that they would say about me is that, Dad was generous. If he had it, he would share it. I hope that's one of the things they will remember about me. Um, because when, you know, when we live to refresh others, we just feel so refreshed ourselves. When we give to others, there's joy in that. And I, I want you to know, our, our, this church is a very generous church. Um, you know, we give to many great causes. We give to a better world. We give to Berman University. So many different great, great causes. Um, because many of us have learned that when we give, we receive. Uh, so let's review before we look at the last point here. Giving makes us more like God. Giving draws us closer to God. Giving is the antidote for, for materialism. Giving strengthens our faith. Giving is an investment for eternity, a secure investment. And giving blesses us in return. Finally, number seven, giving makes us happy. We, we did this series last month, you know, happiness habits. And we, we looked at ways that we can actually you know, build certain habits into our lives so we'll experience more joy. This is one of them. We could call this the extension on the happiness habits uh, series. But, but Acts 20, 35, Jesus says, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. Uh, sometimes you've heard the verse, uh, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But the Greek word there is uh, makarios. And makarios means uh, blessed or happy. Um, and so there's more happiness in giving than in receiving. When, when our girls were young, uh, we did this at Christmas time. We exchanged gifts. But, but we always put the emphasis on uh, giving the gift, not getting it. And how do we do that? You know, I tell you, when I was a boy, uh, what happened is our gifts, you know, when it was time to exchange gifts, very quickly, we just gave everybody their gifts and then you had a pile of them and then you would just open them all and the focus was kind of on, on me, you know. When our kids were young, here's what we did. We opened one gift at a time 
There were six of us in the family. We weren't quite as big as the Lahakis. But there were six of us in the family, and only one gift would be given at a time. And we didn't say, whose turn is it to get a gift now? We would say, whose turn is it to give a gift? And so one of the girls would go, oh, I want to give this gift to, you know, this sister. And, and then we would all wait. Well, that sister opened the gift. And the joy, the expression on the face of the giver, you know, priceless. Because as they watched their sister open the gift that they had purchased with their own money, it was just a little thing. It was just such joy to give that gift. It took forever to go through all the gifts. <laughs> Six people, everyone got five gifts, 30 gifts, and every time we did one gift, it was like a five-minute thing, you know. But we took our time because the focus was on giving. And our girls learned that there's more joy in giving than in receiving. Now listen, I... Uh, Let's go to the next slide here. There are two kinds of people in the world, basically. There's givers and takers. The takers may eat better, but the givers sleep better. Because there's more joy in giving than there is in taking. You know, the, the root word of miserable is what? Miser. <laughs> And when I hold on to what I've got, I say, no, I'm not giving this up. I become miserable because I'm a miser. And so folks, what, what the Bible is saying is that when we give, there's just joy in that. And when we hold on to it and we, we say, no, I'm not giving it, it makes us miserable. One of the most beautiful illustrations in the Bible of this principle is... Uh, when, when King David started to receive donations to build the temple. David was not the one to build it. Solomon would build the temple. But David said, you know, we're going we're gonna to start to receive donations so that when Solomon begins to build, he's got all the stuff, you know, to do it with. So, uh, 1 Chronicles 29.9, it talks about how David gave first. And he gave so much gold. I calculated it here the other day. Um, gold now is a little over $2,000 an ounce, uh, Canadian. The amount of gold that David gave was over $8 billion of gold. So, so David says, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to open this up. People start giving, but I'm going to give first. And he gives over $8 billion. Of course, he was the king and he had, he had quite a bit to give, and, but he gave generously. And so then the leaders gave and the people gave. And the Bible says the people were filled with joy because they had been so willing to give. You know, they were eager to build the temple. They were just excited. And it says they gave their gift to the Lord with a whole heart. And King David was filled with what? Great joy. The one who gave $8 billion filled with great joy because there is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. I want to invite you today to put God to the test. That's what he says in, in Malachi 3. Put me to the test. It's the only place in all of Scripture where he says, put me to the test. And what he's saying is, you give and see if I will not bless you more. And, and, and the reality is we can never outgive God. We can't because God is the greatest giver in the universe. And so God says, you put me to the test. You give and see if I will not give more to you. He promises to bless the generous and his promises are sure. This month, I want to ask you, this month of December, the end of 2022, I want to ask you to invest in the future of the College Heights Church. You know, we've come through a few years during the pandemic where, where giving has been low. I'm just being honest with you. People have been stressed. People, you know, have, have, have lost jobs and inflation and the whole bit. This month, 
put God to the test, I want to invite you to give a special gift to our church family budget, and I'll tell you why. Because when we budget, we, when we budget in 2023, next year, for our ministries, we cannot budget more than what we received this year. And we, we have been, for the last two years, we have been on an austerity budget. We have cut everything out of our budget we could possibly have, even have decreased the salary of, of you know, our locally funded employees. And, and we have not had enough to really move ministry forward in a strong way. I'm just being blatantly open with you here. It's been bare bones. As we look forward to 2023, we are eager to serve our community. We're eager to minister to people. To do that, we need a little bigger budget. And we can only budget more next year if we receive that amount this year. So here we are, our last month of 2023. Will you do something special this month for church family budget? I'm appealing to you, invest in the future of this church. Make a difference. Impact someone's life for eternity. I encourage you to give generously and you'll feel God's joy. Let's sing together our closing song.